All right, so uh, the, the topic that I was assigned tonight before I got, before I distracted myself thoroughly, uh, was uh, uh, is really what, what we might call the sacredness of human life. And I would say this, um, I'm not going to go into huge details about it tonight because I've spent a lot of time on the Holy Week, but I do want to cover the fundamentals. Um, and also, how many of you all who are becoming Catholic already have a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Okay, so a number of you do. That is probably one of the most important resources that you can ever get. It's the official Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's highly readable, and one of the great things about it is it has a fantastic table of contents and a fantastic index. So you can look up topics and read about them. A lot of times the people will ask me a question, for example, about suicide. What does the church teach about suicide? You can look at the index, find that little section, and you can read what the Catholic Church teaches about suicide. Very helpful. Uh, so if you're into uh, paragraphs, um, the Fifth Commandment is the article of the Catechism that deals with this topic. Uh, and the paragraphs of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, all church documents, by the way, are numbered by paragraphs. So this will give you a tiny sense of the length of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The paragraphs that deal with it are 2258 uh, to 2330 with that commandment. So with the morality section of the Catechism, and I love this about the way it structures it, all of Catholic morality is broken down with some introductory materials uh, framed around the Ten Commandments. So I like the way it gets structured, which is sort of an ancient Christian way of catechizing. And um, so if you want to know what the church believes about, what we ought to believe about how we're to live our moral lives, that is a great place to go and to read and study. On your tables tonight, uh, one of the paragraphs that I gave you, uh, both of them speak about the conscience. One of them very importantly talks about the dignity of the human conscience. And I think that section from the Second Vatican Council, which is also quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, is one of the most significant, I think, reflective points when we think about the fact that every single human person that God has ever created, God has given them what we call the gift of conscience, an ability within to discern and know the difference between right and wrong. So our consciences are always urging us to do that which is right and good and true, and they're urging us to avoid evil. Even those who have never had any exposure to organized religion, there's something inside the human person that is intuitively urging them to do that which is right and good, and to avoid that which is evil. Uh, one of the things that, and notes, I'm quoting from memory because I don't have the sheet in front of me at the moment, but one of the things that it highlights is that by our conscience, in the end, God will judge us by how we have followed a well-formed conscience. So as long as we sincerely try to follow our conscience and do what we truly believe is the right and good thing to do, that will be the basis of our conscience, uh, the, the judgment that we have before God. So our conscience works in several ways. It works as we're contemplating doing something. Is this the right thing to do or not? So if I'm thinking, oh, nobody will notice if I, if I you know, don't put down the correct hours I'm working, there, there's something inside me that's saying, don't do that. That's your conscience. Uh, while you're doing the activity, your conscience is also speaking. And after you're finished with it, sometimes your conscience tell, tells you that was not the right thing to do. You should not have uh, raged at the other road driver that way, the way you did it driving down the road. So your conscience will inform you before, during, and after the event. And I think that's significant. And the church says that, so consciences are the inner voice of God. None of our consciences are infallible. They, they can make mistakes. We can be an error of judgment because we don't have all the information. And so, but if we, if we genuinely follow what we believe was right and good, even if our conscience is wrong, it does not lose its dignity. And St. Thomas Aquinas made the important note that even if an authority or the church should tell us to do something that violates our conscience, even an angel of God, we should listen to our conscience rather than that external authority. So, um, however, the church also says 
that it must be a well-formed conscience, that we're docile, we listen to God, we listen to the teachings of the church, we listen to his word, Jesus Christ, and how he reveals a way of life for us. Uh, the Gospels are a preeminent source of reflecting on how we're called to live. And so the more we well order our consciences, the more we listen to them, the more we form them, the more attuned they become. It's like, it's like when you're um, an artist or an athlete, the more you practice at something, the better you become at it. And uh, the contrary is also the case. So if we don't listen to our consciences, we keep doing things that we know are wrong over and over again, pretty soon we, we grow deaf to our consciences. And for that, we are morally culpable if I don't listen to my back inner voice and I start ignoring it and silencing it over and over again so I can misform my conscience. But the dignity of that secret core of sanctuary inside the human person, which no one else may judge, is what we call the subjective norm of morality. So, so we're listening to and attending to where the Spirit of God is leading us within. One of the foundational principles of Catholic morality, and I know that John Corbin taught about morality, but it's a fundamental conviction that every single human person, uh, from the first humans that God ever created, all the way until the end of time, that every single human person is created in the image and likeness of God. So no one is excluded from uh, being uh, in the image and likeness of God. Now, sometimes we don't live according to the likeness of God, but, but it still does not remove the image of God within us. The Imago Dei remains within the human person, even if we uh, pursue a profoundly evil course of life. So for this reason, every single human life is sacred, and at no time is it permitted to take unjustifiably another human life. So let's flesh that out for a moment. Uh, the, the, uh, the commandment, the fifth commandment from the Old Testament, you shall not kill. What did that mean in the Old Testament? The word kill there meant you shall not murder. In other words, you shall not unjustly take a life. Why do I say you shall not murder? Because in the Old Testament, uh, there were obviously, if you read the Old Testament, uh, approved uh, methods of what we call capital punishment. So if somebody violated some great uh, religious obligation or in Leviticus, something, something minor like the breaking of some purity rules, you could be stunned to death. And you heard that reflected in the Gospel last Sunday. And the law of Moses ordered us to stone such women. What do you have to say about that? So, so the, the understanding was human life is sacred and no one under any circumstance can claim for himself or herself the right to directly destroy an innocent human being. And that's why, by the way, Cardinal Joseph Bernardin was very correct in saying that Catholics have a seamless approach to life issues. So the reverence that we have for the child first conceived in his or her mother's womb all the way until natural death, at no point is it justified uh, to take innocent human life. And so that's why, as Catholics, you will find us standing up for anything that diminishes human life, the dignity of the human person. That goes all the way across the board, from uh, the destructive consequences of poverty to the unjust ordering of social goods. Uh, and the church will have a litany of rights that the human person has that society is obligated to protect and respect such as, for example, the right to health care. Uh, that's why, for example, we not only say that the infant of a woman must be protected. And you may notice, by the way, that when Pope Francis spoke to the Congress in the United States when he was here on his trip, he spoke about the dignity of the human person, that every life is sacred. And as Catholics, we know that language very well. That's the language we always use when we're speaking about protecting the child of the woman. And that was my thought. His next comment will be, that's why we oppose abortion. And the very next words out of his mouth were, that is why I urge you now to end capital punishment in this country. So it's very interesting how the Pope himself tied the issue of ending the death penalty with our reverence for human life. So I want to say a bit more about that. Uh, so 
Uh, and one thing I want you to think about a bit, because I know that our culture, the American culture, we can be very pro-punishment uh, for crime. And we can also be very pro-capital punishment. And uh, I think what happens is, when there are horrific crimes, we intuitively, as human beings, identify with the victim, and rightly so. But we often, therefore, dehumanize uh, the criminal in the process. And we forget that they, too, are human beings. And um, one only discovers that, by the way, if you ever have the opportunity to work closely with people who are in prison or on death row. Uh, so, which I've had some opportunities uh, to be with such people. I think about Jesus in the Gospel this past Sunday saying, let the one of you without sin be the first to cast the stone at her. You know, could we conceive of Jesus executing someone when he himself was executed for capital punishment, for example. Uh, I remember when the bishops of the state of Tennessee, along with the United States bishops, back in the 1970s, were working to end the death penalty. Our own bishop of Nashville, Dating Assess, was on, I think of what those days was called the Teddy Bart Show, with a Christian minister from another church. And he said, uh, and Bishop Dating Assess was opposing the death penalty, and uh, the, the minister from the other church was promoting it. And so the, the host said to the minister, could you see Jesus doing it? He said, he certainly would. You know, I, I, I thought to myself, so we can project onto the person of Jesus our own beliefs very easily, rather than looking at what Jesus clearly says and does in the Gospels. So, uh, you know, when he talks about loving your enemies and praying for your persecutors and turning the other cheek and so forth, uh, my good friend Father Joe says, I think when he says love your enemies, he doesn't include bombing them that definition of love. So, um, so the whole world gets reordered when we remember that every single human life is sacred in the eyes of God. So, but how do we approach the tough situations? What do I mean by tough situations? For example, uh, the defense of the innocent. If uh, an innocent human being is being attacked by an unjust aggressor, uh, does one have a right to defend oneself in Catholic moral teaching? The answer is clearly yes. Uh, and if you have the ability to protect an innocent person from an unjust aggressor, you not only have the right to do it, but if you have the power to do it, you have the obligation to protect the innocent. So uh, we have never said that we do not have a right to self-defense, and certainly a right and an obligation to protect the vulnerable and the innocent. So what does this mean? It means that, however, we also are very clear, one may use the force that is necessary to protect the innocent, but not more than the necessary. So if you can use, for example, police are able to use non-legal means to subdue an aggressive moral teaching. So you can only use legal force uh, as a last resort. That truly is the only way to defend yourself and to protect the innocent. Um, the same dilemma, by the way, uh, unfolds in the church's teaching about just war. Uh, you know, the earliest Christian community for the first 300 years, roughly, was pacifist. So they did not take up arms, and in many cases, those who wanted to become Christian were expected to leave the Roman uh, imperial armies and transfer their allegiance to Christ from Rome. So the early Christian community was uniformly pacifist. How did that change in Christian history? Well, Christianity, uh, after Constantine, had the obligation to take care of civil society, and uh, the barbarian tribes, uh, I like to call them Germanic tribes because that's the German blood in me, when the Germanic uh, uh, invasions occurred in the Roman Empire, innocent people's lives were at stake. And it was St. Augustine, principally early on, began to articulate what we would call a just war theory. In other words, uh, when uh, innocent people are being attacked by an unjust aggressor, uh, how do you justify that morally when Jesus and the Christian community had not practiced uh, arms taking up until that point? He said, uh, and he outlined a series of principles that the church has expanded through the centuries. Uh, a war of offense, or what some would call today preemptive wars are never morally justified. Uh, one can only 
use uh, war as a true last resort uh, to respond to an unjust aggressor. So, and, and one has to have a reasonable hope that your action will actually be effective. And there are principles that govern the use of uh, military force. For example, you may never uh, intentionally target civilians. Uh, and you also must uh, calculate with great care to ensure that any violence done uh, in war uh, never has a disproportionate amount of harm to a civilian population. Uh, and the church has categorically condemned in the Second Vatican Council the use of any means of total destruction that destroy what we call weapons of mass destruction are always morally anathema, the use of that in the Christian uh, tradition. So, in the Catholic teaching. Um, so this was articulated clearly at uh, the Second Vatican Council. It's interesting, there's been some evolution on the question of capital punishment. You know, the church always justified the use of, of capital punishment in previous centuries, preeminently based on, I believe, the protection of society. In other words, someone who uh, posed an ongoing threat to civil society. Uh, centuries ago, there were sometimes no safe ways to protect society from such individuals. So that teaching has evolved through the centuries. And uh, Pope John Paul II, in particular, made an eloquent plea throughout the developed world to end that practice. And uh, Pope Benedict continued that plea, and Pope Francis is continuing that plea. Uh, they don't believe that uh, in these days that one can practically justify the use of the death penalty any longer in developed civilized societies. Um, and so uh, I think it's worth pondering that our understanding of the sacredness of human life uh, now is embracing even areas that perhaps many Catholics for many centuries didn't ponder. Um, so um, legitimate self-defense, the protection of the innocent, um, obviously things like intentional homicide, um, abortion are always greatly morally wrong, can never be justified. Euthanasia, uh, deliberately doing something to end a person's life for the natural end, can never be practiced. Uh, and suicide, uh, uh, God is Lord of all life, we may not uh, dispose of this life as at our own will, it's greatly contrary to the love of self, neighbor, and God. And to cooperate with another in suicide is always greatly morally wrong. Now, um, I will also add, and this is where the teaching of the Church on Suicide, I think, is helpful because it also recognizes human reality. Uh, it notes that grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can just diminish one's personal responsibility. So we should not despair of the eternal salvation of those who take their lives. God can provide grace for self, self, self repentance, and we pray for such persons. So uh, that's a good case in point where the church will make a clear distinction between what we would call the objective moral character of an act. Suicide is always greatly morally wrong but we'll also recognize that sometimes the person who makes such a decision doesn't make such a decision freely or willfully or in a healthy state of mind. So their moral responsibility for such an action can be diminished. And that's true, by the way, of other moral evils as well. We can always make moral judgments about the character of actions or inactions, whether they're morally good or not, uh, but we cannot judge the conscience of another human person. So we don't. We can't say that another person is guilty of sin, much less grave sin, uh, because no one knows the conscience but God alone and the person. So um, the church will go on also to talk about respect for the dignity of human persons, uh, that we don't create scandal for others, respect for the health of individuals, for their persons, and the way that they are used or not used in scientific respect and research. Uh, the importance of bodily integrity, so we'll condemn things like kidnapping, hostage taking, terrorism, torture, um, you know, and uh, I would dare say that what we call, what some have called in this country, harsh interrogation techniques, 
uh, would not be uh, uh, considered morally acceptable by the Catholic Church, but would in fact morally be considered torture, whether you consider them that way legally or not. Uh, clearly, anything that would um, uh, create uh, great harm to another human person uh, would be contrary to the moral law. So, uh, and also respect for the dead, uh, corporal works of mercy, uh, proper burial, and so forth. Uh, the church will also, and all of this is under the fifth commandment in the catechism, will also articulate clearly the importance of safeguarding peace in the world, doing everything that we can to eradicate the causes of war, and will articulate uh, some of the just war theory that I just spoke about. Uh, and I think has some very good concrete things. It also, and Pope Francis addressed this to the United States Congress as well, talks about uh, the moral evil of the accumulation of arms. And uh, while it has been justified in the past at points um, to counter aggression from another country, uh, the church also notes uh, that just having arms alone never ensures peace. In fact, it often aggravates for the causes of wars. It multiplies reasons for conflict, increases the dangers of escalation, and, um, and it also harms the poor because money spent uh, on uh, the military uh, is money that could be used to assist those who are in need. So um, the injustice, uh, excessive economic and social inequalities, envy, distrust, pride, these are the things that constantly threaten peace and cause wars. Everything done to overcome these disorders contributes to the building of peace and the avoiding of war. So this seamless garment of life that Cardinal Bernard had talked about is found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, under the commandment, do not kill. So any threat that injures or harms the dignity of the human person uh, must be uh, opposed and things that help the dignity of human persons develop and support it. Uh, that's why, by the way, when you start focusing in, for example, in the United States on politics, uh, Republican or Democratic platforms, most Catholics who are attentive to what we teach are aware of the fact that we don't really find a good political home anywhere very easily because rarely does any political party, platform, or candidate adequately represent all of the things that we believe are moral concerns and priorities. Um, I'm pondering, because we are in an election year, I'm pondering actually doing a teaching unit this summer that will focus on um, Pope Francis's address both to the United States Congress and to the United Nations because I think there he articulates uh, a fundamental Catholic moral vision about how society and the world should be well ordered. Uh, another great resource, if you want to read more, if this is an area of interest to you, uh, one of the four great constitutions of the Second Vatican Council, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes, has an entire section focusing on this particular area of life. Uh, how do we properly order human society in a way that reflects the kingdom of God and the moral values that we believe in. So I think that the work of uh, promoting um, a vision of respect for the sacredness of human life and dignity that is constant and ongoing. And uh, the challenge is that we don't depersonalize human beings. Uh, it's easy to do that when you don't see them. Uh, that we don't depersonalize the poor. That we don't depersonalize the elderly in nursing homes that we don't depersonalize uh, those on death row, that we don't depersonalize um, the infant in the womb. Uh, by the way, there's a wonderful um, uh, film, not done for religious or spiritual purposes, by Nova, one of the first times they were able to look inside the womb at the development of the child, called The Miracle of Life. If you had a chance to watch that, it shows everything from the moment that the sperm and egg unite all the way to birth, and you see the unfolding of the child in the womb of the mother, and anyone who would see such a film, I think, would have a hard time arguing that that's not a human person that's unfolding, and certainly a human life right in the womb. So the sacredness of being human from the first moment that we're uh, conceived in the womb of our mother 
uh, all the way till we take our last breath, and the respect that human persons uh, are called to. All right, that's my 30 minute wrap up on So, we're just looking at a lot of questions. Yeah, the use of the atom bomb during uh, World War II in Japan. The interesting thing there was that's where a technology developed before the church had a chance to do moral reflection on it because we never had a, a weapon before in human history that could annihilate uh, without distinction civilians and combatants. So we didn't really have a specific teaching about such a weapon at that point. So it was only in light of, um, so that happened, what, in the mid 40s? It's only by the mid 60s that the church articulates clearly the teaching about weapons of mass destruction. So, um, and of course, the moral argument during used during the, Great, the Second World War was that the Japanese were not going to fight kill the very last person. And so uh, the argument was made that. Uh, those weapons brought a conclusion to the war that would have otherwise cost many lives, both Japanese and allied lives. So uh, it's hard to second guess decisions that are made after the fact. Um, but certainly the use of uh, nuclear weapons today uh, would not be justified. You know, on the other hand, the strange paradox is, you know, during the Great Part of the Cold War, perhaps even to some point to this day, you know, the fact that both sides had extensive nuclear arsenals may have protected the, the whole human race from one side using them against the other side and, and thus radiating the world and severely damaging a human and plant and animal life everywhere. Quick side, which I didn't get because we're focused on sacredness of human life tonight, but obviously the church also has a strong commitment to taking care of the natural world that God has given us and the Pope has published an encyclical on that. And that has developed over time, too, because we're at a new point in human history where, for the first time, human, human activity on the planet now has transformed the entire planet in a way never before seen before the technological revolution or the uh, industrial revolution in all of human history. You know, we were kind of always looking on the edge of nature, and now uh, you know, we are transforming the globe in many ways. So uh, caring for the home for uh, of the planet for our own sake and for the sake of future generations, uh, the, the Pope's teach is also a great moral obligation. All right, that's my last bit, unless any more questions, because we still have another witness talk. True.